Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to our worship service this morning. Uh, very cold outside, but actually very warm in here, so, so that's a good, a very good thing. A uh, couple of announcements uh, for us uh, here before we begin. You can always find those in the back of the bulletin and also on uh, our, our website. Um, some care group uh, opportunities this week. If you're not uh, involved or a part of uh, a care group, uh, simply ask uh, one of the elders uh, or myself and, and we can direct you uh, in the right direction. And then also, uh, I would be remiss to not point out that uh, baby shower this Saturday uh, at uh, our house. Um, I will not be there for that, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure it will be a great time uh, in spite of my absence. So, uh, ladies, if, uh, uh, if you're able to make it, uh, be a, a good time uh, for everyone. Uh, that being said, uh, let's turn our attention now uh, away from my bad jokes and onto what we uh, have uh, come here to do, uh, which is to worship uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you would please uh, stand with me uh, as we open God's word and as he calls us from it uh, to worship him this morning from Psalm 49. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich uh, and poor. Indeed, let's give ear to the Lord now. Let's uh, continue to worship him uh, by singing praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Heavenly Father, we would ask now that uh, you would again make good on your promise that where we have gathered to worship you, that there your Holy Spirit would be. Uh, we pray uh, that he would come now and be uh, present with us, uh, guiding us, directing us, uh, stilling our hearts so that your word uh, might enter uh, and transform us from the inside out. We pray this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from, we're continuing on in Exodus, continuing the story of God's great deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. So we're reading uh, in chapter 14, the first 18 verses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pi-Hira, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, opposite Baal Ziphon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering about the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he made his, had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Hirah, opposite baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians, marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord, they said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would, would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water. <clears throat> so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory through Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Thus far in God's inspired word. Sometimes verses just jump off the page at you, don't they? The Lord will fight for you. And what do you have to do? You only have to be silent. Amen. Let's uh, humbly uh, go before the Lord now. Uh, you'll find the prayer of confession in your bulletins. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, do what you must do to work true repentance in our hearts for our sins. We confess that we take our own sin far too lightly, 
and we are far too casual in our attitudes and thoughts about the sins that we commit daily. You are a God who is all holy and who cannot have sin in your sight. We throw ourselves upon your great mercy and ask that you not cast us out of your sight, even though we deserve it. We thank you that in your love and mercy that you let our sin fall upon your only Son, Jesus, and it was him that was cast away on us. Father, forgive us of our sins, not because of what we have done or not done. Forgive us because of what Jesus has done and not done. He fulfilled your law perfectly on our own behalf. We thank you for this gift of salvation and ask that you continue to help us sin less and less. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Be assured of your pardon. Psalm 49, why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me? Those who trust in their wealth and belt boast of their great riches. No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. Salvation is not uh, something that we do. It's not that you, it's anything that you are even able to do. Salvation is a work of God, uh, and he has done it. He has accomplished it for us, uh, full uh, and free through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's stand again and sing hymn of thanksgiving, whate'er my God ordains is right.
How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. What are the decrees of God? The decrees of God are His eternal purpose, according to the counsel of His will, whereby for His own glory He hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. We go to prayer. We can say indeed whatever my God ordains is right. And it's a very appropriate affirmation as we come to him with our needs and with our thanksgiving. Just a couple of brief updates on some who have been in the hospital. Uh, Pete Lanning has been in for about a week now with pneumonia. Uh, they're keeping him there till his oxygen levels are higher and he's stronger. Uh, Chuck Bergner had surgery on Tuesday, a triple bypass surgery. I was successful. He's uh, doing well and expects to be home today. They expect a slow recovery. It's great that his son from Arizona has come out and is going to spend six weeks at the home and helping Alice. So they're very thankful for that. His son can work remotely at this time. Okay, please join me. I'll be praying for items in the bulletin. He holds me that I shall not fall, therefore to him I leave it all. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we come to you, the great creator God of the universe, three in one. We come this morning with our prayers. Father, we thank you that you so loved the world that you sent your Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, we thank you. You left the glories of heaven to come to earth, become human, live the righteous life that we could not live and die the death that we deserved. Wow, what, what an exchange. You took our sin and gave us your righteousness. And we can now call God our Father and share in your inheritance of everlasting life. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ongoing work in our lives, comforting, convicting, sanctifying us, and assuring us that we belong to a loving Heavenly Father. We pray for one another in our congregation. Pray for Nelson and Sandy Schoon, our church members of the week. Father, we begin by thanking you for your grace in the lives of Nelson and Sandy, bringing them to trust in your provision of your Son, Jesus, as their Savior. Please continue to bless them in their marriage, Thank you for restoring their health over the past few years, and please continue to watch over them. We pray for their family, particularly at this time, your daughter Tricia and her husband and son who have COVID and who are recovering. Please give them a complete recovery and soon. Pray for Nelson's first cousin, Butch, whose wife died suddenly of a heart attack, leaving Butch, who's in very bad health, with not only grieving about his wife, but now also in need of a caregiver. Please comfort him in his loss and provide for him and help his family in caring for him. And for Nelson's stepsister, whose husband has ALS and who is deteriorating rapidly. Oh Lord, this is such a devastating disease. We pray that you would deal with him and his family with compassion and with mercy. Pray for Pete Lanigan. Uh, Lord, we thank you that there's been improvement in his lungs uh, as they are treating the pneumonia. And also thank you that his heart is functioning well and that's not, this problem was not due to a heart uh, issue which was the initial concern. Pray for your healing of Pete's pneumonia, that his oxygen levels would rise, that he would grow stronger and that he'd soon but at the right time be discharged. And please be with Arlene as she travels to be with him in the hospital and she cares for him when he's discharged. And for Chuck Bergner, we thank you that the heart bypass was successful. 
not as invasive as they initially anticipated. We pray for a good recovery for Chuck with no complications. And we thank you that his son could be here to help Alice in his care. And Lord, we pray for one another in these times that are challenging for many of us. We take comfort in the fact that you are a sovereign God. Please develop in us this, at this time the fruit of patience and kindness, fruit that is needed at times when we may be feeling shut in and simply wish that things would go back to the way they were. Please give us perseverance. May we care well for each other at this time. Lord, you are our refuge and mighty fortress. And we, I do thank you for the rapid development and availability of vaccines for COVID. Thank you for giving such knowledge to men and women made in your image and used as instruments of your common grace. We pray that these vaccines would prove effective in reducing the spread of COVID. And please continue to watch over us, our families, and our neighbors. And Lord, we pray for our leaders at the country and state and national level as they seek to navigate through this challenging time in our history. May they do it with wisdom, courage, justice, and compassion. And we pray for the mission of the week, for Joel Irvin and the Heart City Church plant in Elkhart. We praise you with them, Lord, for your evident presence in their church, Thank you that Elkhart's COVID numbers continue to decline. Thank you for providing that uh, young congregation with a website guru to help them get started in that. And, uh, thank you for uh, Joel's wife, Jamie, as they walk through this endeavor of planning a church together. We do pray, Father, that the word, the light of the gospel will go out in that community. Uh, we pray for Mark, a member of their congregation who's home from a bad fall. We pray for recovery and perseverance. Pray with them for ordained leadership of the church. For those involved in helping get their new building ready for use. And Lord, we pray with them that you would open doors to declare the mystery of Christ in our Lord. Oh Lord, please hear our prayers. Uh, guide our pastor as he preaches your word. May you do it with clarity and grace. And may we be not only hearers, but doers of it. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Would you stand again with me and uh, let's continue to worship God by singing the power of the cross.
And if you would, uh, take your uh, Bibles with me. And I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke 11, uh, 1 through uh, 13. And as I uh, looked at uh, what uh, other ministers that I trust and admire have, have done with passages such as this, uh, almost all of them have uh, divided it up into about six or seven sermons uh, dealing with different petitions of the Lord's uh, prayer, uh, seen as we've uh, undertaken to preach through the Gospel of Luke and we're not even halfway through, a year and a half in, uh, I thought it fitting to uh, just cover it in one sermon. So that's uh, sort of where we're going uh, with this this morning, and I, and I really want to concentrate on uh, the first uh, petition, really, which uh, deals with uh, God as our Heavenly Father. So let's uh, read uh, Luke, uh, starting, uh, Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Uh, now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is God's uh, holy and errant uh, and inspired word uh, that He would uh, write its eternal truths upon each of our hearts as our uh, asking this morning. Uh, prayer is not an easy thing to do. Anybody that has ever tried to pray uh, knows this or pray consistently. The Scottish pastor, Robert Murray McShane, once said that if you want to greatly humble a Christian, simply ask him or her about their prayer life. I'm here to ask you this morning, how's yours doing? Uh, something that, that should be simple to a certain extent, right? Uh, uh, we should be taking time to do it. Uh, but so often, it seems to be one of the most forsaken uh, things in our daily schedules. Things come up, uh, we get distracted, we get uh, uh, called up and, and called away from uh, uh, various tasks throughout the day, and before long it seems uh, that prayer uh, is merely an afterthought. Well, uh, focusing upon prayer and, and understanding this God whom we serve, uh, is uh, one of uh, maybe the greatest uh, uh, encouragements to us to pray, and, and uh, I would contend one of the greatest remedies to a weak uh, or struggling prayer life. Uh, if you look at uh, the opening of uh, this uh, passage, uh, we see Jesus is praying. We ought to seek to emulate Jesus. We ought to pray ourselves and pray consistently um, each and every single day. As he's finishing, uh, uh, yet again, uh, his his prayer life, one of the, the 12 disciples comes to him, and you see that there. He says, Lord, teach us to pray as John, that is John the Baptist, 
taught his disciples. We don't know what this uh, instance is that this disciple is referring to, uh, but obviously among disciples following after their teachers, there was a great need to know how to pray, but they simply didn't know quite how to do it properly. And so Jesus instructs here. And you'll notice in verse 2 and 3 and 4 uh, that uh, this version of the Lord's Prayer is, is significantly shorter than that which we find in Matthew. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, what we have before us or what we pray as the Lord's Prayer in church is, is wrong or, or unbiblical. Uh, it quite simply just, I think, points us to the fact that Luke had his own uh, agenda and objectives that he wanted to accomplish when writing his uh, particular gospel. And so uh, uh, this is the, the beginning. Jesus says, uh, verse 2, Father, hallowed be your name. Now we're going to stop right there this morning and, and look at what this means for us and for our prayer lives. Uh, first of all, uh, that this shows us that we have a, a radically different legal status than the one that we were born with. You look at the Bible uh, uh, throughout. How does the Bible describe you and me? It describes us not as children, at least not initially children of God, but what? Children, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, children following after the spirit uh, of this air. That we are wicked, we are sinful, that we are so consumed in our sins. Uh, it says we are slaves to sin. Forced, uh, we can't help but, but sin. That's how all of us were born. Born into sin, uh, loving our sin. And yet here, we're taught to pray not as slaves to sin, but as children of God, calling God our Father. Joel Beakey tells the story of uh, a slave market uh, during the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s in Charleston, South Carolina. The, the largest slave market uh, in America was there. And one young uh, African girl was brought on the stage, as would have been uh, the, the procedure then. And uh, uh, the men in the audience uh, began sort of chuckling and laughing and sort of fantasizing as to what they might do with their, this young slave. And the bidding began. Uh, and one young man continued to bid and bid and bid a, a considerably higher amount uh, than this young girl was worth and purchased her and as she came down from the stage uh, she spit in this man's face and he uh, uh, slowly and without saying a word led her down the street uh, a ways uh, stopped at a particular office there in Charleston and uh, told her to wait there and she spat in his face again the man went in uh, this office was there for a bit came back out with paper in his hand and she again spat in his face. And he took the paper out and gave it to her and he had gone into a lawyer's office, had purchased this young girl's freedom and had gone in and changed her legal status. He goes on to say that this is a, a great picture of the gospel for us. That here we are slaves to sin. Uh, knowing nothing but our own sin until Jesus comes one day, purchases our salvation for us at enormous cost by laying down his own life. And by that act of love changes our legal status. We are legally now no longer slaves to sin, but we are now children of God. It bothers me sometimes to hear Christians talk about uh, their uh, uh, status as Christians. And oftentimes you'll hear them say, well, I'm just simply a, a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. That's not all you are. You are so much more than that. You are a child of God. You have been purchased at a tremendous price. 
the death of Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of what he has done, because of this great love that he shows you, your legal status is now child of the king. You see that what that means for us as well. It means that we're, uh, as children, that we uh, have abundant wealth. How do we have abundant wealth? Uh, listen to what Paul writes in Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit, uh, that is, in, in our prayer, all who are led by the Spirit are, uh, of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You see what we've inherited by this work of Jesus, by this work of salvation? We have inherited everything. Everything that God has becomes ours. Access to the throne room of grace in our prayers. Uh, uh, wealth abundantly, knowing God as our uh, Father. That He defends us, that He protects us. That He guides and directs us and instructs us. All this wealth we have at our disposal. So my question then to you is, is why are we not using it? I mean, think about it for just a moment. If, if you found out tomorrow that, that some distant relative had left you a trillion dollars in some, I, I don't know, Cayman Islands account, and you are going down the road, you have this money in the bank, this, this incredible amount, and somebody steals $5 from you, you lose a 20 out of your wallet. I mean, does it really matter that much? If you have all that in the bank, of course it doesn't. So let me ask you then, why do we as Christians especially tend to act more foolishly, more belligerently, more out of our minds consumed with rage and hostility towards the world than it would seem anybody else does. And don't tell me it doesn't happen. I mean, uh, even though I've, I've, I've happily uh, been off uh, social media now for uh, well over a year, I feel like an addict that has been freed. Um, uh, I've seen what people write on there, and Christians are among the worst at it. This whole political season, uh, even though I didn't see it, I, 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 so you can feel it. What does it matter really in the grand scheme of things when the abundant wealth as an heir of uh, uh, the child of God, all that is there for you. I mean, does it not start to pale in comparison? I, I hope it does. The, the, the little uh, uh, annoying things in life, the annoying things of this world. And that's where we need to be. You know what we call that? It's called being well adjusted. It's, it's, it's part of our sanctification. As we grow in grace, we become well adjusted better equipped to deal with these annoyances. That's all they are. They're fleeting uh, uh, things that, that, that cause us to struggle. But really, from this perspective, they're really that big a deal. Certainly, I would argue, not worth the uh, uh, energy that we put into voicing our disapproval of a lot of these annoyances. So we come to God, we're taught to come to Him as such and to claim and to recognize that we have uh, all, these spirit, all this spiritual wealth uh, at our fingertips, at our disposal. Second thing this shows us, I believe, is that we are given access to God. Now there's two uh, stories here. 
given that Jesus uses. Uh, one of a man traveling uh, at uh, night. Uh, he goes to his friend's house because he's had visitors arrive uh, unexpectedly, uh, has not had ample time to prepare. Uh, he knocks and knocks on the door of this friend's house. Finally, he opens the door, uh, but tells him, I, uh, verse 7, I cannot get up and give you anything. I'm in bed. Uh, Jesus goes on to say in verse 8, uh, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, uh, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And he goes on to say, continue to ask, verse 9. Uh, ask and it will be given. Keep knocking, in other words. Continue to be persistent in your prayers. Why? Because he's, he's saying, hey, acknowledge, notice, look who you're asking this of. It's God. God will give and he does give. It doesn't mean that he's, he's slow or, or annoyed that you're asking. It's simply encouraging you to continue asking. Yes, oftentimes your prayers uh, uh, don't get answered necessarily the first time or the way that you want them to be. It's simple encouragement. Keep asking. Keep going. Keep uh, 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 knocking. You have that access as a son or daughter of God. The second thing I would say, though, is, is be careful of this. Uh, be careful. What, what do I mean by that? Well, you have access. That means that God has access to you as well. But I think along these lines of the frustration that can sometimes come from knocking and knocking and knocking at, at somebody's door, oftentimes uh, I have found in my own life, and I'm sure the same is true with you, the answers that you receive in prayer are not always what you uh, are expecting or even maybe wanting or desiring. Uh, E.H. Uh, Glifford uh, once wrote, Human love offers a true analogy. The more a father loves his son, the more he hates in him the drunkard, the liar, the traitor. Oftentimes, what we find out about ourselves and our prayer lives is that things aren't really right within us. And that we have a lot of changing that we need to do. I don't know about you, but last time I checked, I, I don't really like being told that I need to change things. I think I'm pretty good at, as I am. And I would imagine most of us have this attitude in our hearts as well. But the fact of the matter is, if you have access to God, God has access to you, and oftentimes what you're going to find, the response is, is that there's some change that is needed. Are you okay with that? Are you willing to face that? The other thing that I think access shows us is that, um, uh, that we do go and, and we need to spend time with God. Very often, uh, I mean, one of the greatest things that prayer does for us is that it changes us. It softens hearts. It, it causes love to grow. If we're going to do that, if we're going to allow ourselves to be transformed and changed, we need to take the time to spend time with those that we love and those that love us. The same is true with our relationship with God. You need to be spending time with Him, and prayer is a very large part of that. Finally, I think uh, one of the last things that we see as far as our access to God is the protection that He provides. If we are to be children of God, and we are, we become God's legal responsibility. So often when we talk about uh, adoption, uh, we think about uh, uh, the, the, the father's role. Um, don't often look at it from the child's perspective, but, but think about that for just a moment. Some of you maybe have adopted children yourself. Uh, that child is now your legal responsibility. In other words, you, you have certain responsibilities that you uh, have. 
to offer, to give to that child. But but think about what that means to that child. They not only have a a changed legal status, uh, but they now are protected. And as much as you are able to protect that child, and you should. That what happens to that child, I mean, talk to any parent about this. They know what happens to your child happens to you. And nothing, I think, springs a a parent into action quicker or faster or harder than when their child is threatened in some way. We have this uh, assurance from God as well. That we belong to Him, that He has adopted us, that, that we are legally His and the responsibilities that He shows to us is that He protects. He provides, he uh, uh, garnishes and gives his love to us to protect us, to transform us, to lead us forward. Thirdly, uh, and finally, if you look down at verses 12 uh, and 13, we won't get to the second example that Jesus uh, uses here, but talks about a father Uh, giving uh, uh, to his son good things. Uh, But finally, the certainty that we have in coming to the Lord uh, in prayer. You see that there? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We've said already that we have new identity as uh, uh, children of God through what Jesus has done uh, for us. But there is always, I think, this nagging question sometimes. How do I know that God hears my prayers? How do you know that? How do you know that you really have access to God the Father? How do you really know that this inheritance that you have received isn't some bogus promise that never comes true? What certainty do you have, in other words, to spend time, to be disciplined in your prayer life? How do you know for sure? And the answer that, that, that comes to us is quite simply this. Look to the cross. I mean, that's the answer to so many questions and doubts that we have. Look to the cross. How does the cross help us in our prayer life? Well, think about it for just a moment. What? Uh, first of all, when, when, when Jesus prays, right? Every time you see Jesus praying in the Gospels, he, he, he does the same formula. It's the same one he's teaching us here. We pray to God as our Father. Jesus prays to him as Father, even sometimes using language that we see Paul use in in, uh, uh, Romans 8, uh, Abba. Some people think it means daddy. It doesn't quite mean that. It's it's more intimate even than that. Uh, It's uh, an Aramaic uh, expression. It's it's kind of like uh, down south when when they they, they call Papa and Mama or uh, in Ireland sometimes you would hear children talk about their granda, uh, right? Their granddad. Uh, nobody else could call uh, that same person granda. Only a select few knew them as such. It's kind of the, the meaning uh, behind Abba there. It, it, it's, it's, I think, much more significant than just daddy. Uh, uh, oftentimes, Jesus would pray, Abba, Father. But every single time he prayed, and I mean every single time, look it up. He addresses God as Father except one time. Significant. On the cross, what does Jesus cry out in prayer? My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? Why have you forsaken me? You see what that means? You see what he's doing there? Jesus loses his access to the Father on the cross so that you might gain it. Jesus loses his access to God. Jesus, in other words, gives up his prayer life on the cross 
so that you and I might gain it. Jesus was cast out of his Father's presence so that you and I might be certain beyond all doubt that we will never lose the face of God our Father. This is what Jesus does for you. He, this is the sacrifice that He makes. It's not just to secure your salvation, although it is that, but it's to secure your relationship with God. To secure your prayer life, if you will. So you know that when you go before Him and you address God as Father and say to Him, Father, I need this, or Father, I confess that, He hears you. And this is why, incidentally, that we conclude our prayers as Christians in Jesus' name. We are claiming the work that Jesus has done for us, the access that He has freely given us in our prayers. We're acknowledging that we're coming with that. That's how you can know. That's how you can be certain. It's why you should go more and more to Him. Because we know by looking at the cross beyond all shadow of a doubt that He hears your prayers. He welcomes them graciously and gladly. And that He takes them to His Father on your behalf. Thomas Goodwin close with this, uh, tells the story uh, about walking down the street one time uh, in, in uh, uh, England, old Puritan. Uh, and before him, I believe it was in London, was a father and son walking together. And um, uh, at one point, the father picked up his child and held him in his arms and said, I love you. And then the child said, I love you too. And set the child back down again. And in his writing, uh, Goodwin asked the question, he says, at that moment, is that child legally any more a son uh, than he was before? And the answer is no, he's not. He, uh, when his father is telling him he loves him, he's uh, still as legally then his child as he ever was before. But what good one goes on to say is, is that, that, that at that moment he is experiencing the Father's love more and more. And in a very real sense, that's exactly what we're doing when we go before the Lord in prayer. We are experiencing His love. His love that He poured out upon the cross. His love that He has given freely so that you might no longer be a slave but his child. Uh, Love that that we experience and the wealth that we now have before us as heirs. Love that gives us confidence to come to him. The question then becomes quite simply, will you take the time to do it? Go to him. Pour your heart out to Him. Your desires offer up freely to Him with all confidence, knowing that this is what He has done for you and that this is, at least in part, one of the greatest ways that we experience the love of God is by praying to Him. Let's go to Him now. Father, we praise You for this great love that you have for each one of us, that we have seen displayed upon the cross uh, that faithful day outside the walls of Jerusalem, uh, that you would freely give up, uh, your son would freely give up access to you so that we might gain it. Impress this upon our hearts that we might uh, turn to you more and more live for you more and more and be more and more diligent in our prayer lives. We ask this in Jesus' name for the sake. Amen. To conclude our service this morning, uh, let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus.
now the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Thank you.